I'm honored to introduce Rashawn Davis, who joined the Andrew Goodman Foundation in July of this year as our new executive director. In his time at AGF so far, Rashawn has shown a deep commitment to our staff, our community, and our future. Rashawn has served in both the public and private sectors and has a passion for social justice and a commitment to closing societal gaps that disproportionately affect marginalized communities. Prior to joining AGF, Rashawn served as the director of the Racial Justice Labs at change.org. He also served a term as commissioner on Newark's historic police review board where he was appointed by Newark Mayor Raz J. Baraka. And when he was 21 years old, close to the age of Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Earl Cheney in 1964, he ran for city council in Newark, New Jersey. Today, Rashawn is also a member of the board of directors for the W.E.B. Du Bois Scholars Institute at Princeton University. Rashawn graduated from Georgetown University with a bachelor's degree in government and from New York University's Robert F. Wagner School with a master's degree in public administration. So now that I've shared a little bit about his background, let's hear more from Rashawn. So Rashawn, can you tell us a bit more about your journey and how you came to be part of the Andrew Goodman Foundation? Yeah, I can do that. And um, I just want to take a moment and thank everyone for being on the call today. It's always uh, strange to hear your bio read, um, but I'm so grateful for my experiences and all of them that have led me to this point. Very good to see some familiar faces on the call. I see we have some of our board members. Robert Masters is on the call. I see Ralph is on the call, who's working on a play about Andrew Goodman's story and, and the story of the Freedom Freedom Summer. Um, I see we have lots of our ambassadors, some of our champions on the call. And so um, I, I think even in a virtual environment, it's so good to see the Andrew Goodman Foundation community come out uh, and support us this morning. And, and I'm just so grateful to be here. Um, Margaret, to your question about my journey here, I've described this to a few folks, and I think um, it still holds true that uh, it, it, in a lot of ways, is very poetic that I'm here right now. Um, what we do here at the Andrew Goodman Foundation, and all of you know this, our mission is about empowering young people, right? We want to make young voices and votes a powerful force in our democracy. That's at the core of what we do. And I can remember, as Margaret mentioned, when I was 20 years old, uh, a junior in college, I decided I was gonna run for a city council seat in my hometown of Newark, New Jersey. If anyone's from New Jersey or if anyone has roots in Newark, feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, but I decided to run. I, I didn't know what the process was. I didn't know what to expect, but me and a few of my friends from high school and college knew that we wanted to make a difference and we decided to put some money together. We had about $100 in a bank account and we said we were going to run. Uh, we were going to knock on a few doors, show up at a few debates, and that was going to be the end of it. And I remember I was able to reschedule my classes at Georgetown and I had classes Monday through Thursday. And then I was on a bus back to Newark on Friday and campaigned through the weekend. And so we attended our first debate. We did our first weekend weekend of door knocking, and a hundred dollars in a campaign account turned into a thousand, and a thousand turned into ten thousand, and so on and so forth. And something that was supposed to be uh, just sort of a one month project turned into eighteen months of my life and um, my entire career. Everything I've done since that election uh, has been grounded and influenced by those eighteen months. And in particular, seeing the power of young people to make a difference. We lost that election, but to this day, I get messages from young people around Newark and around New Jersey uh, who want to run for office and, and want to have their voices heard. And so I wish when I was running that there was a program like Vote Everywhere. Um, and I wish that I was involved with the Andrew Goodman Foundation then. And, and so to be here it feels like a very much a full circle moment for me. And I'm so glad to be able to be here and serve our young people and our young leaders. And I haven't met all of you yet. 
Uh, but trust me when I tell you that I get stories on a weekly basis of the amazing things that each and every one of our ambassadors are doing, the amazing things our ch our champions are doing on our campuses. And so I'm just so happy to be here and thrilled to get to know each and every one of you and also very excited about uh, what it's, what's in store for the future of this organization. Thanks for sharing um, your story about running for office, Rashawn. I find that so amazing and inspiring. Um, and we actually have several ambassadors from our program program who've run for office too and campus champions. Um, so it's definitely, definitely a trend. Um, I have another question for you. So what specific experiences or events have influenced your commitment to civic engagement and social justice? Yeah, I think um, anybody who's been involved in public service, service or organizing knows that once you start to do it, you sort of catch a bug for it. And um, I mentioned that I ran for office uh, when I was 21 in Newark and we lost that election, but I spent 18 months knocking on thousands of doors and, and understanding uh, what the issues were in my community. And um, I had a lot of options about what I wanted to do next. Um, but I decided that I wanted to become a community organizer with the ACLU. And so I did some community organizing with the ACLU specifically around police reform. Um, I, I'm sure everyone here knows that uh, our country has been dealing with the challenges of public safety and what that looks like in different communities and how we make public safety better and make sure that it works for everyone. And uh, Newark and New Jersey uh, were right in the middle of that uh, discussion. And so I was a community organizer at the ACLU talking with uh, police departments and talking with community members about uh, what the future of public safety looked like. And so I say that to say, um, when you take an issue that is so contentious as public safety can be, especially if you live um, in a city that struggles with violent crime or um, other public safety threats, uh, things like how to make police departments better can be very contentious issues. And so being able to spend many, many months with community organizations and also folks who are from police departments, you get to learn what it means to sit in a room and hash out issues and communicate and talk, um, reach consensus and move forward. And so I would say for me, that is the experience I had that really taught me the power of not just community organizing, um, but what real community resolution can look like. What happens when you bring people together in a room, even if they have different opinions, even if they have different perspectives, and knowing that uh, we all share a bit of common ground. And so that community organizing experience uh, certainly grounded me uh, through my career, and it also affects the way I lead today. Thanks for sharing that, Rashawn. Um, so transitioning a bit to your thoughts on the role of young leaders in our democracy, uh, I'm curious, in your opinion, what unique contributions can young leaders make to our democracy and how can they affect positive change? Yeah, I, I mean, um, and our board member, Robert Masters, who's on the call, is an example of this. Uh, he uh, was one of the folks in 1964 who made his way to the South uh, to fight for justice. And the premise that I always start with is, um, no great change in this country has ever happened without the force of young people. That's period, full stop. If you look at if you look back to the very beginning origins of this country, you will find that it was young people who always broke ground. I don't know how many folks know the story of Phyllis Wheatley, but Phyllis Wheatley is widely considered. Uh, the first African-American to be in contact with the United States president, and that was George Washington. And Phyllis Wheatley was a 17-year-old African-American poet. Um, and George Washington writes in his journals about how much that experience of chatting with Phyllis Wheatley affected him. And so 
when you think about these huge iconic cultural moments throughout the history of this country, and also these moments of social change, they almost always happen because of young people. And when you think about the civil rights movement, uh, what we know is that Andrew Goodman wasn't 35 or 40 or 50 years old. He didn't have a law degree and spent many years uh, contemplating this. He was a 20 year old college student who had a gut feeling that the world could be a better place. John Lewis was 18 years old when he left his home in Troy to join the movement. Dr. King was 28 when he started the Montgomery bus boycott. And so if you look at the history of this country, you will find that our most significant changes have happened because of young people. And the same is true today. If you look at what's happening across our country and you often look at some of the loudest voices in the room, you see that it's young people who are demanding better for us. And so I just think our democracy is better when young people participate and also that our country moves forward when young people participate. I agree with you completely, Rashawn. I think, um, as, you, as you said so eloquently, um, young people catalyze change in our nation and always have. And I think we are so honored to have so many of those young people in our own um, program here with us at the Andrew Goodman Foundation and on this call today. Um, so next, could you could you share with us some of the key initiatives and projects of the foundation, you know, that we're currently working on to advance our mission? Yeah, so I, I mentioned this uh, when we first started chatting, and I think all of you who've been involved with this foundation know that core to what we do is making young voices and votes a powerful force in our democracy. It's very simple. And we do that a bunch of different ways. I would say at the core of what we do is our Vote Everywhere program. And we have champions and ambassadors on this call, uh, but that is our flagship program here at AGF. Um, and every year, ambassadors across the country, on college campuses across the country, um, do civic leadership. I mean, it, it's it's that simple. Um, we're in, we have 110 ambassadors currently across 26 states, and each of them are leading important conversations around civic involvement on their campuses, whether it's North Carolina A&T, whether it's Montclair State, whether it's University of Alabama. In each of these communities, we have student ambassadors on these campuses who are fundamentally leading the charge with civic leadership. And I'm so excited about that. And so that's the core of what we do. We let our ambassadors guide us. Uh, we lead from behind and they direct the ship and we get behind them and we're happy to do so. We also have, uh, as you all know, this incredible legacy story of Andrew Goodman, um, who was one of the folks who made their way down to Mississippi. And not just Andrew Goodman, but there are so many people who were involved in Freedom Summer 1964 that are also involved with this foundation. And so we also see our work as keepers of that story. Um, Mo Banks, who is our director of communications, runs a podcast that's actually in the chat if you all want to check it out. And so what we do there is a lot of storytelling about these leaders of the past who helped our country get to where it is today. Um, Robert Masters, again, who's on our board, uh, is one of those folks whose story is captured in our podcast series. And so we have our Vote Everywhere program, which is really about the present and young people who are leading the charge. And then we have our podcast, which is about telling those stories. And we're also thinking about our future as an organization and how we wanna grow and. How do, we make, how do we make sure that the successes we've had over the past 10 years with Vote Everywhere, we can spread them out to young people wherever they might be? Because we know young people just aren't on college campuses, right? We know young people just aren't on four-year college campuses. Some of them are in community colleges. Some of them are in the workforce. And so our mission is about reaching young people wherever they are. Um, and so our work right now it's about thinking about how we take the successes of Vote Everywhere, how do we take the storytelling from our podcast 
and really grow our organization and making sure that we reach young people wherever we are, wherever they are. Yeah, thank you for shouting out the the podcast, Rashawn. Um, Mo actually put the link to that in the chat, and there was a bonus episode earlier this week on on Michael Schwerner. So please do listen to that if you get a chance. I should um, also shout out uh, Caroline and Mia and Gabrielle and Kaylee, who are on our team here, who lead so much of our program's work, including Vote Everywhere and. I know there are some ambassadors on the call, so th those folks aren't unfamiliar to you. So, uh, but but they they really are the ones who powerhouse our vote everywhere program, um, and so we're we're grateful to have them. And thank you all for all the work y'all are doing. It's hard to support 110 young leaders on uh, many campuses across 26 states, uh, but these folks every week find a way to do just that. Yeah. Definitely a good point. Shout out to the programs team. Um, and that's actually a good segue into this next question because y'all are really the ones um, working with our campus champions and ambassadors on the ground and helping us to lift up these stories. Um, so Rashawn, could you provide examples of young leaders who have made a significant impact through their involvement with the foundation? Yeah, there are many. Um... Too many to name on this call. Uh, I, I just to backtrack a little bit. Uh, we're really excited because next year is the tenth anniversary. I see Jonathan Becker just got on the call. Good to see you. Um, next year is the tenth anniversary of Vote Everywhere, and it's been a decade worth of student civic leadership that we have under our belt. And there are so many stories. Evan Malbro, who uh, is a member of our board, the work that he's he's done um, in Georgia, particularly around voter registration in Georgia, particularly around making, vote, making voting more accessible to folks who uh, who are who voting is often a challenge. Um, and so folks like him, folks like uh, Saudi Asaba, who was an ambassador at Bard College and uh, decided that they had enough and that they were going to be a plaintiff in a lawsuit and was able to win an on-campus polling place. Uh, folks like Sam Robson, who was an ambassador at the University of Alabama, and he helped create uh, Return My Vote, which was an online voter, re voter restoration clinic. And so ambassadors across the country over this past 10 years who have been doing uh, just really phenomenal work and even today, we have ambassadors on the call, uh, and I see uh, a lot of the project updates that you all have, and there are exciting things that are brewing. And if we do have some ambassadors on the call that are willing to share more about their work on campus, feel free to drop it in the chat. I'm sure people would love to see what you're working on. Um, but yeah, we have 10 years of wins, 10 years of successes, and I think part of what we need to do a better job of is letting the world know uh, just the amazing things that our ambassadors have done and will do and continue to do even after they're finished uh, with their education. Yeah, as Rashawn said, we are very excited to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of Vote Everywhere next year, the 60th anniversary of Freedom Summer, and we have had so many incredible stories over the years and know that the, the champions and ambassadors on this call are continuing to do that amazing work on the ground. Um, speaking and of- Just, I, I'm sorry, cause I'm seeing folks and I, and I wanna just make sure I wanna acknowledge them. That this, even this year, when we talk about the power and the wins, uh, y you know, one of the things that we have done um, we've made significant strides in, but is not often known is our legal footprint. Um, in AGF has had a history over the past 10 years of uh, our board member, David Goodman, uh, uses the phrase litigating when necessary. Um, and so there's been a lot of that. Uh, AGF has filed a um and, and several uh, lawsuits that have fought for student voice, that have fought for uh, democracy for young people. I see Yael Bromberg is, is on the call, and she's one of those folks who uh, has been our partner 
in that work and, and is also uh, very much a 26th Amendment uh, expert um, that's been involved with AGF for quite some time. So I just wanted to name that, that we, uh, increasing student voice and student leadership in our democracy is core to what we do. And we take many approaches to doing just that. Definitely. Um, speaking of, you know, increasing student voices in our democracy, yesterday was election day in many states across the nation. Um, so how how is AGF involved in promoting civic engagement and voter participation in the upcoming elections? Rashawn, I think you're still muted. Sorry, y'all. Um, what I'll say is that where we start from is voter registration, right? Our Vote Everywhere program is about civic leadership. It's about um, our ambassadors going to their campuses and going into their communities and being civic leaders. And oftentimes that results in a significant amount of voter registration. And uh, over the course of a decade of Vote Everywhere, we've uh, register thousands of young people to vote, and we're really proud of that. And so when it comes to elections, one thing that we are always certain of is that AGF ambassadors will always show up to the polls, and that AGF ambassadors will always encourage their peers, their family, their community members to go out and vote. And so when we talk about um, elections, the way we see it here at um, AGF is about making sure that young people's voices are a part of the discussion. And the way that we do that is empowering our ambassadors, making sure that their voices heard, are heard. We do that through our podcast. We do that through making sure that our ambassadors have the tools they need uh, to register uh, st other students on their campuses, to register folks in their communities, um, and so that's that's what we do. That's fundamental to what we do. Uh, some of our ambassadors even go further um, and they get deeper involved into elections. And so we find that in every major election that AGF ambassadors tend to be involved in one way or another. And we do what we can to support their civic leadership. But we're proud that every AGM, AGF ambassador comes out of the program with a set of skills and a set of understandings about how they can make sure that their voices are heard in every election. The big ones like we have coming up in 2024 and the ones that often get ignored like the off-year elections uh, such as the one we had yesterday. Right, we definitely know here at AGF that there are no off years um, and every election, every election cycle is very important. Um, so I have a one last question for you, Rashawn, and then we'll get to the open floor. Um, so what advice do you have for young individuals who want to make a difference in their communities during the next set of elections? Yeah, I mean, there there's so many, but I think the most sound piece of advice I can give is internal piece of advice. When you are young, I think sometimes there is an assumption that because you are young, that your voice, your opinion doesn't matter. Um, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Sometimes it's by design to make you think that your voice and your opinion doesn't matter, but it actually does, right? What, what we know is that next year, 41 million members of Gen Z uh, will be eligible to vote. That is a significant number. It's, it's an electorally altering number. And so if you don't think that because you're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, that uh, your voice and your vote doesn't matter, I think 41 million, you have 41 million other folks who will say differently. Um, and so for me, it's, it's being registered to vote is where you start. Um, the second is if you're at if you're in college at a four year university, uh, becoming an Andrew Goodman Foundation ambassador. Um, but even if you're not engaging with the ambassadors on your campus, 
we have our site that folks can use as resources to understand the issues that are happening, to understand how to get involved, how to use their voice. But for me, the biggest advice, and I know you're going to hear from other folks who say, you know, you should go out and do this big thing or do this big thing. And really, the biggest advice I can give is register and vote. Uh, I live in a community where a third of our population is under the age of 35, and um, yet uh, those under 35 have very little representation um, at the city level, at the county level, at the state level. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, young people just aren't coming out to vote. And so part of our work here at the foundation is not just thinking about how we register young people to vote, uh, but also how we compel folks and engage folks to actually show up at the polls year after year, because your voice is important and your vote is important. All right. So we've now reached the portion of our meet and greet where the floor is open to all of you. Um, so I'll start with questions for Rashawn that have already been entered into the chat, but I do I do um, invite you to continue to submit now. Um, we do have some time, so get your questions ready and enter them into the chat, and we'll go from there. Um, so the first one that I want to ask is, um, Rashawn, going back to your vision. So what's, you know, what's the core mission of AGF and how does it align with your vision for the organization? So I think um, the great thing about our vision is that uh, it is also what industry folks call a theory of change. Oftentimes you have uh, a mission for an organization and then you have to build a theory of change. Ours, ours is simply, uh, empowering young voices and votes in our democracy. And that's both our mission, and it's also the lens with which we look through everything. It's also our theory of change, that our democracy is better off when young people participate. And so for me, that mission makes it so that the next stage of, Andrew Good of the Andrew Goodman Foundation is really about reaching young people where they are. I'm sure folks have seen the many studies and news articles that talk about uh, young people uh, more and more so than ever um, are reconsidering four-year universities, four-year colleges. And we see young people opting to go to two-year uh, colleges and junior colleges. We see young people going straight into the workforce. And so again, our mission is not to just empower young voices and votes that happen to be on a four-year university. Our work is about meeting young people wherever they are. And so for me, the next stage of our growth here at AGF is taking the successes we've had with Vote Everywhere and thinking about how we can meet other young people wherever they happen to be, whether that's at a junior college, whether um, it's even, you know, before someone gets into higher education or whether it's postgraduate as well. It looks like we have a question in the chat for you. Um, so Mia said, when you reflect on the story of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner, what comes to mind and how are you living the legacy? Yeah, I... I the thing that comes to mind, honestly, is, and I talked about this at the top of the discussion, is this idea of age. And I know there's been lots of conversations across our country about um, age and voice and who gets a say in our democracy. And the thing that I think about when I think about that story is these were young college students who weren't professionals. Uh, they weren't particularly experienced uh, in any of this. They had gone to trainings, but these are just young people who felt something in their gut and went for it. And so for me, when I think about that is our legacy story as an organization, and there is a through line between that legacy story and the work that we see every day in our ambassadors. 
ambassadors, right? We have 110 ambassadors across 26 states. And that same instinct that Andrew Goodman uh, and Cheney and Schwerner had in 1964 is that same instinct that ambassadors have in 2023 across our campuses, across 26 states. Um, so I see that really as a through line. And for me, um, personally, as ED, I think part of my work is making sure that we never lose that bridge, right? We're getting further and further out from the civil rights movement. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the way we talk about the civil rights movement um, has gotten a lot smaller. It's become a bit watered down. And I see part of our work is making sure that we never lose that bridge between that instinct that motivated young people in 1964 is the same one that motivates young people in 2023, and it'll be the same one that motivates young people in 2043. And so I see my job as ED as being a bridge between our legacy story, the past, um, and the work that we do currently, and also our future. All right. We've got two more questions in the chat. Let me just start with the first here from Kaylee. So she said, looking ahead, what strategies and approaches will AGF employ to ensure that young people are actively involved in shaping the organization's future initiatives and programs? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think um, I mentioned this earlier, but I really believe in this concept of leading from behind. Um, all Everything that we do is because of our ambassadors. And so even when we think about growing as an organization, we want that to be informed by the experiences of our ambassadors. Uh, we had something called uh, the Puffin Fellowship for a while, which was uh, a postgraduate fellowship for um, ambassadors who were leaving college but wanted to stay involved. And uh, we have an ambassador, and I won't say their name, uh, just not to embarrass them, but uh, they're at North Carolina a and and uh, I was able to chat. We, As a team, we were able to chat with some of our ambassadors there. And the message that we got was, although they were graduating, um, they very much wanted to stay civically engaged. And so that put up a light bulb in our head about um, how can we continue to offer programs and services uh, for even young people who graduate college but still want to stay involved, still want to have um, a level of support when it comes to civic engagement. So to that question, um, my job is to make sure that all of the things that we do, particularly around growth and expansion, are informed by what our student leaders want and need. And um, I thank you for whoever asked that question because that really is a question about accountability. And I think that's something that our entire team here at AGF makes sure that we do, which is center the voices of young people. It's not just our mission, but it's also how we work. Right, Rashawn, you have a bunch more questions in the chat now. Um, so Caroline is asking, what has inspired you the most so far in the month since you joined AGF? It's been so many things. Um, I got to say our ambassadors, right? And it's just because I'm never not awed by the courage and the audacity that young people have, right? Like we have ambassadors that um, are in, and, and I'll just uh, and I'll just say it this way, uh, that are in uh, some of our nation's most challenging states. And again, every week, every month, we see these young people relentlessly trying to build a different community, trying to build a better one. And I think I'm always really inspired by that. I think when you sit in the seat that I do, it's it's easy to kind of put your head down and lose track of what's going on, but um, our programs team and uh, everybody at AGF does a good job of just reminding me of the incredible work that our student leaders are doing. And 
I'm never not inspired by the things that I hear and the things that are that I see that our ambassadors are doing and the things that they go on to do even after they graduate. Um, and then it's our staff, right? I've been here since July. There are folks who have been with AGF for quite some time and almost everyone has been here longer than me. And I can tell you that I've worked at many places where the job is just a job. And I think for many um, of our staff members at AGF, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's a value proposition for them. I, you know, it's even, it's difficult for even me to explain three months in, but um, there is a loyalty here. There is a passion here. Um, there is a resoluteness to serve young people. And that passion is, I think, why AGF uh, has had the staying power that it has, because it hasn't always been easy for our organization, but we've had staying power. And that's almost entirely because of the passion and commitment of our board um, and our staff. Sean, we have a question in the chat from Warren Rigby from Montclair State University. Um, so his comment says, you mentioned partnerships in 26 states. What is your vision and or strategies to increase these partnerships to expand the work of AGF to even more states? Okay, Warren, I just want to say, uh, you know, shout out Essex County. I also live in Essex, Essex County. Um, a close family member of mine just enrolled at Montclair State. So I have a special place in my heart right now. Um, and this is a really good question. Um, we work in 26 states, and I mentioned this, but we are a small but mighty team, and it's a lot of work to manage uh, 110 ambassadors across 26 states, but we know that our mission is about empowering young people wherever they might be, and so growth means trying to connect with as many young people as we can, and growth means trying to provide as many young people with resources as we possibly can. There are lots of ways to do that. Our team has experimented with things like online modules to support young people. Um, one of the things that we are considering too is partnerships, right? We Part of leading from behind is starting from an assumption that we don't need to do everything, right? What does it look like for us to partner with community groups that can reach audiences that we can't? And we've been lucky enough because we have... Uh, long long term relationships with many universities that we work at um we know who the community groups are we've done work with them in the past and so we're thinking about how do we invest in those partnerships more um and how do we support our partners in reaching some of the audiences that we can't so when we talk about growing and expansion it's not just about us here at AGF doing everything it's about us being an organization that supports the movement for empowering young people broadly. And that's through partnerships, that's through storytelling, um, and that's through empowering our universe, even our universities who want to, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, bring this work even deeper into the infrastructure of the campus. All right, Rashawn, we have one last question for you in the chat um, from Tiffany Thornhill. She says, does the foundation have any plans for creating a conference or retreat for ambassadors and campus champions to come together collectively? So yeah. they want to think between Vote Everywhere chapters. This is also a good question, Tiffany. It's like you've been in our team calls. Um, we, for a long time, had uh, the NCLTS conference, which was our major yearly conference that brought together our student ambassadors, our champions, and also just leaders in the democracy space, leaders in the social justice space. And um, it was such a success. And every ambassador I talked to that was able to attend an NCLTS always has fond memories of it. It did stop uh, in after 2020 when the pandemic hit, 
um, like any other organization, uh, we the pandemic was challenging. And so we're in this process of rebuilding as an organization and trying to get back to uh, some of the things that worked well for us. So the, the, sh the, long, the short answer to your question is we would love to bring back NCLTS and our conference for ambassadors, champions, leaders in the space. The hard answer is uh, we got to find a way to pay for it, right? And so uh, our team is working hard. Um, we are talking to our funders. We're talking to our donors. Um, and we do hope to bring that back. Uh, just I just asked for some patience, but it is very much top of mind, Tiffany, for, for our team. Thanks, Rashawn. Um, so as I just mentioned in the chat, that was our last question. Um, but you're more than welcome to come to us with, with questions at any time. So you can reach us at info at andrewgoodman.org and we will get back to you if you have any other questions for Rashawn. Um, so on behalf of all of us, I wanna thank you for joining our meet and greet with Rashawn today. We hope to do more of these in the future. Um, and as I mentioned at the top of the hour, we are planning to send out the recording of this event. So we invite you to share it with your networks. And we also ask that you stay connected with us in a number of ways. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, listen to our podcast that we shouted out a couple of times, and you can even join our texting list by texting AGF to 47020. Um, so we look forward to staying connected with all of you. And again, we thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you soon. Thank Bye. you all so much for joining.